Hi, I'm Kevin Rusnak, the Chief Historian for the Air Force Lifecycle Management Center, headquartered at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base outside of Dayton, Ohio. I'm here today with our pr producer, Joe, from Public Affairs. Joe, you want to say hi? Hi, Kevin. Hi, everybody else. Good to be with you. Thanks for joining us, Joe, and to our audience. Thank you uh, for, for tuning in here. For those of you not familiar with LCMC, it's our responsibility to manage most of the programs that provide the Air Force warfighters with the systems they need to do their jobs. It's, that's everything from uniforms to fighter jets. It's what we call acquisition here in uh, the, the military community. Uh, but for the history office, it's our job to understand and keep track of how we and our predecessors have accomplished that mission since the Army bought its first airplane from the Wright brothers way back in 1909, so over a century of history. We're constantly trying to find ways to connect our current workforce to that history to help them better understand the present. Just like soldiers and airmen out in the field might study past battles through, through military history, we believe that the acquisition professionals here can learn from understanding how their predecessors did those same jobs, but within different contexts. How can we learn from that history? We can do that the same way, I think, that, uh, that anybody else can. Uh, but one of the ways we try to do that here in the uh, LCMC History Office is by diving into our archives to find historical events related to the missions that we perform today, but that occurred on the specific days and weeks uh, that we're in right now, uh, but from these past decades, and then sharing those events with uh, the center as a whole. And you can actually find these stories uh, on the LCMC website if you go look. These are everything from just a short paragraph to uh, maybe a page or so of history. But sometimes we find that one of those stories have a lot more information or a lot more interesting um, than what we can squeeze into that particular format. So now we've teamed with the Public Affairs Office, our, our buddy Joe on the other end, to tell these more detailed stories in a new video series that we're calling Out of the Hangar. And today, this is, uh, this is the very first one of those. Uh, so we hope you enjoy it um, and, uh, and stick with us until the end. So uh, this first one here uh, is related to the gentleman you see in the picture on your screen. He was Lieutenant Carter Harmon, and 80 years ago, on April 25th, so that's 1944, he was the pilot for the first military combat rescue by helicopter, and this was in the middle of World War II. So this is a great story for the Special Operations Forces. It's key to their mission is, is rescuing personnel. Well, you can go read about the actual operation there, you know, what he did out in the field in great detail uh, with our friends over uh, in, in Special Operations from um, from their history offices. But for our piece, I was interested in the acquisition story behind that. How did he get the equipment? How did he get that helicopter? And why was it there uh, in the middle of World War II? And why, why did it take to that point to, to provide a helicopter for an operational mission? So diving into that history, what we found is though the idea of helicopters had been around since, you know, at least Leonardo da Vinci uh, with, uh, with, with his, his designs. But practically speaking, it wasn't until the early 20th century that we saw helicopters start to become more of a thing. For our predecessors in the Air Force, um, we go back to 1921 and the engineering division um, at McCook Field here in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, they were the first kind of acquisition or research development organization dedicated to aircraft, uh, but this was still under the Army Air Service at the time. There was no Army Air Force. Well, in that year, in 1921, their commander which I'm going to show you the picture here in just a second. There you go. The two gentlemen on, on that you see on your screen, the one wearing the, the straw hat there, that's, that's the commander of McCook Field, uh, uh, Major Thurman Bain. He became interested in helicopters uh, because of his connection to the other gentleman you see there, uh, the kind of shorter, uh, uh, more, more stout one. Uh, that was a Russian named George de Bothazat. He had come up with an idea for a helicopter, and he was actually working for the predecessor to NASA at the time. Well, Thurman Bain brought him to McCook Field and gave him a contract uh, for about $200,000 to design, build, and test uh, our first helicopter right there at McCook Field. And so he did that. It took him a little longer than they had planned, but in December 1922, uh, that, that uh, contraption you see behind the two of them and you can see a little bit better here in this picture, uh, that first took flight with Thurman Bain himself as the test pilot. Well, you can see in that picture, there may be six, eight, 10 feet off the ground. And unfortunately that's about as, as far as that was able to fly. It could never really 
um, operate like a, like a true helicopter. And after more than 100 flights proved that that was kind of the limit, its limitation, uh, we canceled the program to both of that left to go do other things. And the Army actually didn't look at helicopters for another 15 years um, until the, uh, the mid-1930s. Um, what we did look at in the, in the uh, meantime, in the uh, kind of the mid-1930s, a few years earlier, um, was something kind of a hybrid between a helicopter and an airplane called an autogyro. And that's our next picture here. Um, as you can see, an autogyro has a propeller in the front like an airplane that gives it thrust. That's what makes it move forward. But it's also got the blades on top like a helicopter that provide lift. But unlike a helicopter, those blades aren't powered. They just turn as the uh, auto gyro moves forward to provide that level of lift. So it, they couldn't hover and go straight up and down like a regular helicopter, but they could take off in a much shorter distance than a traditional airplane. Well, these didn't work all that well, and they had a very kind of small, um, small market for these. So the industry didn't exactly take off, pun intended. So they're looking for ways to kind of bolster their fortunes. And one of their one of the companies uh, in the U.S., actually the one that produced the ones you see in the picture there, called Pitcairn, they lobbied their congressmen to get one of these sort of pork barrel appropriations to develop auto gyros to a more significant degree. So they secured three hundred thousand dollars that went to the Army Air Corps, um, the successors to the McCookfield people that. McCookfield actually shut down in 1927 and moved to what's now the modern Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, but at the time was called Wright Field. Um, so they, that Wright Field got that $300,000 to expend on, quote unquote, rotary wing aircraft research, development, procurement, and experimentation operations. So they decided that they were going to spend the money not on auto gyros, but on helicopters because at that same time, the Germans had de debuted the first practical helicopter. And so we quickly realized that, hey, that's gonna be the wave of the future. So the primary beneficiary of that was another Russian like de both is that, um, named Igor Sikorsky. If you know anything about helicopters, that name is still kind of synonymous with helicopters. He had worked for McCook Field back in the 1920s briefly, but now had his own company and he developed America's first successful helicopter um, called the, uh, the VS-300 Hoverfly. And this contract that you see there was the first one that we had issued to them, uh, to that company, for the data for that helicopter. So that's really our first helicopter money after we get, got past the both is at one. So just kind of a cool piece uh, from the archives. Well, what did the helicopter look like? It looked like this right here. This was the military version of that. We provided them that money with actually about $60,000 to improve that hover fly into what the Army called the XR-4, and that's what this is. And the XR-4 was first flown in, uh, in 1942, uh, just a few months after, or about a month after Pearl Harbor had started World War II for the United States. And then it was flown from there to Wright Field for experimentation. And that's what this picture shows is when they were testing that. You can see why special operations forces that might, uh, you know, want to rescue people or deploy people in dangerous areas would find a helicopter very valuable. The next picture here shows uh, the helicopter right after it arrived here at Wright Field. The gentleman on the left uh, with the, the darker mustache, uh, that's Igor Sikorsky himself. And standing next to him in the dark suit, that's Wilbur Wright, or Orville, excuse me, that's Orville Wright, who had moved the pilot of the first, uh, the very first flight back in December of 1903. So after we uh, demonstrated the helicopter and decided it worked pretty well, we procured a couple of dozen of those for, for further testing. Here's a good example of that testing, uh, one that crashed right here at Wright Field. Those hangars behind there actually still exist here on Wright-Patterson Air Force Base today. Uh, but as we were testing those, word got around that, that we had this, this new kind of capability available. And so there was a gentleman who was charged by the Army Air Force with setting up our special forces in World War II, uh, Lieutenant Colonel John Allison, and he was uh, kind of the founder of what they called the First Air Commandos, uh, special forces out in the China-Burma-India theater, so kind of uh, in, in around India. And one of the things they were doing was flying supplies from our allies uh, in India over the Himalayas in, to support our allies in China to fight the Japanese. Well, there were lots of airplane crashes and things, so lots of need for, for rescue out there. Well, Alice, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Allison came to Wright Field, checked out the helicopter and says, yes, I need one of those. 
So he spoke to the program office here that was running the program and to Air Force leadership. And after some negotiation, he was actually able to convince Wright Field to sell to send four of these YR4s. And now this was the 4B model, a little bit improved. Uh, but importantly, it had an attachment on the outside to carry either a stretcher for a patient or up to 300 pounds of bombs. Um, and that's the one you see in this uh, this kind of wrecked uh, picture here. That's one of those B models. So we sent four of them over to India for the air commandos to use. One of those, unfortunately, never made it there because the cargo plane it was in crashed. Uh, and two others were actually wrecked by one pilot who was trying to learn how to fly those. So we, we sent a fifth one out there. So they had two operational ones for a little while that arrived out there in late 1943. Well, fast forward a few months after experimenting with the helicopters, learning how to fly them. Um, they finally found um, their first their first use in April of 1944. They'd been a little bit limited because they didn't have a whole lot of range. So we couldn't find a good use for them uh, at first. So, uh, but the opportunity arose in April. So what happened then? Well, um, that on the, the 21st, there was an army light aircraft that they, we used for air rescue that was transporting four British soldiers that had been wounded in combat. Well, that, that army airplane was shot down by the Japanese behind enemy lines. Uh, and this was in Burma, um, next door to, to India. And so they needed to be rescued. Well, the call went out to these first air commandos and Lieutenant Carter Harmon got the call. And this is actually him in this picture flying the helicopter. And this is the exact helicopter he used to do this first rescue. So. He flew that, that particular helicopter over 700 miles. And this is him again, going back to his headshot. He flew that over 700 miles over a day to get to the crash site. And um, once he was there, the helicopter wasn't working quite as well as he had hoped. Uh, the power was sapped by the altitude and the temperatures and all that. Uh, but he was able to actually extract all of the men from where they were hiding, still surrounded by Japanese troops who were actively hunting them. He could fly in there into a small area, take each troop one by one, take them out to a nearby spot where one of those other airplanes could pick them up and then bring them off to a different base for uh, uh, for treatment. So it took him over a day. He actually had to stay overnight uh, at that at that location because of uh, the problems he was having with the helicopter. But nevertheless, by April 25th, so four days after he started the mission, uh, he had successfully evacuated all, all of the, the men from that crash site and completed this first helicopter combat rescue using that uh, that YR-4. And uh, we're gonna go to one more picture here. That's him, uh, he's actually standing in front of uh, the, the cockpit um, on kind of on, on the left as you're looking at the picture. And for his, his bravery, he earned the Distinguished Flying Cross. And they went on to fly more missions with these helicopters. And the helicopters themselves proved to be very useful and different models were tested at right field and other places. So we actually ended up procuring and deploying hundreds of helicopters for rescue purposes, transport, and all these other things that having this kind of vertical flight really enabled. Um, and so you may not think about helicopters being used to a big degree in World War II, um, and maybe relatively speaking, they weren't, but that's certainly where they made their debut. They proved their worth so that in later conflicts, particularly in the Korean War, for those of you of a certain age, you may have watched the TV series MASH and seen how helicopters were uh, a critical part of, uh, of medical airlift operations. Um, that wouldn't have been able to happen if it wasn't for this kind of proof of concept that was done way back in, in 1944 by our friend Lieutenant Harmon here and by the acquisition professionals at Wright Field, now Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, who provided that equipment to them. So that's kind of the end of our story for today. And uh, Joe, if you, unless you had any questions, anything I may have forgotten to, to throw, in, throw in the the story here? No, I always appreciate a good MASH reference, though. <laughs> well, I, I do I do like to, to, to squeeze in pop culture uh, references whenever I can. And that, that, that was a pretty obvious one this time around. Well, thank you. All right. Well, then... Uh, Go ahead. Thank you for thank you for joining us. And uh, we'll see you next time with a, hopefully another interesting story for for the audience.